Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday and Cthulhu has gotten very judgy. I fixed my shot. I realized that Momo was pushing my monitor back and back and back because he sits between my keyboard and monitor. Um, and so I fixed the shot and Cthulhu ended up quite judgy and I thought it was hysterical. So I left it there. So maybe Cthulhu is just bracing himself for the topic today because we're talking about what I suggested we talk about on Friday, whether, you know, the word feminism has lost its meaning what does it mean so on and so forth we're gonna dive in and uh, it's good because I talk about this every so often so people can see how my thinking has evolved and my relationship to the concepts have evolved and that's my main reason for doing this today I didn't put this up on Twitter just because that way lies madness um I wanted to read people's comments and make this a fairly positive experience for people where we can discuss things and bat around concepts and come at it from different perspectives without getting those, you know, zealots who are so rigid in their thinking they don't have concepts of other perspectives that don't match their own, right? It, it's better to keep it in a place where I can reasonably control how big the blast gets so if you like this sort of content help support this channel become a monthly patron monthly support very important patreon.com slash liana k and you can buy one-time liana care sessions for people who could use it and can't afford it coffee.com slash liana k links are all in the description box um the the wonkier, headier moments of this video are inspired by some Leanna Care sessions. Some people just get sessions to be able to talk about stuff like, you know, I don't understand the whole trans thing. I don't understand this whole definition of a woman thing. And they just want to talk about it without getting their head bitten off or called, you know, a bunch of names. And so I thought that was interesting. Um definitionally like this war of definitions has really eclipsed a lot of practical applications of concepts and I find that personally very frustrating because I'm an abstract thinker um I'm like all right I don't care what you call this thing let's just identify the thing set a definition for ourselves and apply that definition and actually get to work making the world less shitty, right? That's where I come from. I do not like definitional fights. I am good with, okay, this is what it means to me. This is what it means to you. Great. We'll try to bridge that gap as much as we can Let's move forward, please. Words are just chunks of meaning. But I understand the vast majority of people don't think that way, which is why these conversations are important to have. And the problem right now with defining feminism is, you know, feminism is usually, well, it's the, it's the advancement of women's rights based on equality of the sexes, right? Um... And uh, International, International Women's Development Agency defines it as advancing and protecting the rights of diverse women and girls with a vision of gender equality for all. So, you know, they, they, made, they made the point of saying, you know, not at the expense of men, right? Which you have to do now because of some of the stuff out there. Um, and then you get into fights over waves and all that stuff. But before we even get there, we have to acknowledge that there are now arguments over the definition of woman. And this stuff drives me crazy because people don't come into it not only they don't come into it with an open mind, they don't come into it with an understanding of 
what we're actually doing when we're arguing over these definitions, right? I mean, people are just so sure that they know what something means. And again, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I require far less certainty in things than, than most people I know. I'm just like, well, and I, I guess it's because I've been, you know, working in the arts and, you know, I was producing television at a very, very young age, uh, started when I was 19. Um, and so, you know, I had to make calls based on incomplete, imperfect information. And sometimes I'd get it wrong and get in trouble. And sometimes I'd get it right. And that got taken for granted. And I just got very used to making decisions lacking you know, you can't 100% this stuff. But people who have been trained in things like computer code, where, you know, definition of variables is incredibly important. And, you know, every little thing in the code matters or people that, you know, are, are trained in the sciences. Um, there are processes and, and there are there are reasons that they care very much about biological observations. And I get all of that. Um, the thing is, we actually have to look at the connotations of gender identities more than the denotations of you know, biologically female, biologically male, um, so on and so forth. Why does this matter, right? Because if there weren't values tied to these statuses, stati, stati, there wouldn't be a fight. There wouldn't be this bruising fight, right? And it's because... Why did it matter? Well, for generations, man, white man, white woman, everybody else with man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, right? Uh, the way race is navigated, the way gender is navigated, it's all about where you are on on this this stack right and the the various european powers during the colonial era um went to great lengths to justify denying women things like voting rights and you know justifying race-based slavery and race-based discrimination using a combination of biblical stuff, really whacked out pseudoscience, and ancient Greek philosophy, particularly that of Aristotle. And the reason I call out Aristotle is because there was a real disagreement between Aristotle and Plato about women, whether women should be educated and whether women uh, could handle the same responsibilities as men. And Plato said, well, yeah, if you want women to be able to have the same responsibilities as men, you better educate them just like men. And Aristotle had very different attitudes towards women. Now, um, Aristotle had more than one wife. I believe he had two wives. Um, and yet he thought women had fewer teeth than men. So he never thought, you know, hey, Mrs. Aristotle, can you come over here so I can I can count your teeth? To, to check that theory. No. That, well, tells you how much we can rely on Aristotle on, on the idea of gender. But he thought essentially that women were... Womanhood was the state of lacking something. That man was the highest form of life and that women were basically lacking in masculinity. He referred to women as deformed men at one point. And that did trickle in through uh, 
theological scholarship that justified, because, you know, there was no separation of church and state back then, uh, justified a lot of these inequalities, the, the idea of natural law that some people were just ruling classes and some people weren't. Uh, that justified the divine right of kings, that justified race-based slavery. I mean, the the original three racial classifications that you can't even say anymore, they're considered so offensive. That's what it was designed to do, right? It wasn't actual science. It wasn't take hypothesis, test hypothesis. It's this is what we want to do. Go give us a permission structure, Right. And that's really important to recognize that a lot of the things we associate with race and gender, a lot of the connotations of race and gender actually are not real. And, you know, that that doesn't change the reproductive facts of producing more humans, right? But that's not really most of the time what people are using when they talk about gender. However, the association with women and motherhood was artificially joined through state propaganda as one of the justifications for denying women's rights, paying women less, um, kicking women out of the workforce after World War II. It's all women are happiest as mothers. This is their natural place. This is how women are most fulfilled. So we're doing a woman a disservice by taking her away from that. We shouldn't be stressing her out with things like the right to vote or a job outside the home. You know, even though... Um, the Greeks and the Romans, uh, once currency became a thing, um, they started pulling certain tasks outside of the domestic sphere into the professional sphere, giving women less to do. Um, baking only became, for instance, a paid profession when men did it back in those days. Um, again, because they had all these justifications and permission structures. This is the stuff we're really dealing with when we talk about gender and we talk about the status of women, right? We, we have to examine what being a woman means in various societies. And it does not mean the same thing in every society. And I mean, there's, there's cultures, there's subcultures within the Toronto area where there's been, you know, a lot of immigration, uh, especially, you know, South Asian cu cultures where women are, you know, making very rapid advances. And there are these culture shocks that, and, and there are, you know, discussions going on. And, you know, uh, that's why movies like turning red are so important that they bring that into public understanding. But let's look at the reaction to turning red um, just for a moment as an example of this stuff, right? There were some people that were just outright disgusted about the discussion of periods of menstruation, the the implications of that stuff, you know, the the jokes, the kind of play on um, the name of the movie, and this has always struck me as very strange, right? Because when we talk about kind of, um, if if you take sort of masculine bodily functions, there's less. It there are things that are like you gross. But it's not the same, you gross, because of the whole boys will be boys nonsense. And this is where people start arguing with me, hear me out, you know. Um, certain, you know, like for instance, public urination. When you tend to see jokes about that, it tends to be a guy taking a pee, right? 
the history of it is um, public toilets for a long time were only for men. So if a woman got caught outside the home, she'd have to like take her big puffy skirts, stand over a storm drain and hope for the best. I'm not kidding. Why? Because they wanted to keep um, they wanted to keep women in the home. That's where they thought the rightful place was. Seems insane now, right? But this is the history we're coming from. And I've spent all this time talking about this because when we get into, you know, equality, even figuring out what equality means where we come from a tradition or a series of traditions, this fucked up um, is difficult, right? Because equality, or as they say now, equity, um, means different strokes for different folks. Not everybody needs the same things. The idea of equality to me is that everybody has an equal opportunity to reach their potential without artificial barriers put in their way. And this is when somebody, well, everybody has that. Sure, right? You know, money is a big one for a lot of people. In the UK, in the UK class structure is a big one. Um, you know, here in Canada, whether you're born in a rural or, or, or urban community, can sometimes really impact things for you. Indigenous status can really impact things for you. I mean, that's the biggest issues we have facing women in, in Canada is, is, you know, the, the, the treatment and the status of um, Indigenous women. Um, and you see this all over the place, right? It's impossible to take a woman's issue and make that clean. And this has been true for the entire history of feminism. I talk about this all the time, that we, we tend to flatten and oversimplify the past waves of feminism. And so, okay, first wave was about the right to vote. Not exactly. Yes, it was about the right to vote. It was also about uh, improved workplace conditions for women workers, the ability to keep the wages they earned and not, you know, give it to the husband or the father, stuff like that. The ability to rent, uh, rent housing, that sort of thing. That was also part of the first wave, but that's been lost to history because the suffragettes were all about, you know, the right to vote. And so people thought, oh, everybody agreed. No, they didn't. You get into second wave and, you know, yes, it kicked off with, uh, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, which was about, you know, upper middle class or middle class housewives post World War II in this malaise. Um, and, you know, so, OK, that's what it was broadly defined by. But then it got into reproductive rights and equal pay for equal work. But then there was a massive schism um, with, again, Betty Friedan calling lesbians contingents in in second wave feminism the lavender menace. Oh, they were in the way. And we're still sorting that out. It's very, very interesting to me that a lot of turfiness in uh, the the trans exclusionary feminist wing is made up of certain lesbian groups because man have they forgotten their history like come on you guys were on the receiving end of that during the second wave what are you doing like just because third wave became more inclusive you know doesn't mean you can forget that but that that's what you tend to see throughout history is people who are like, I got, I got mine, now get yours. And they don't stop and think and they don't, you know, well, that's different. I was right. Right. And people like, well, it's not the same trans women and lesbians. 
it kind of is in that we're getting further and further and further away from the definition of womanhood being tied to reproduction. Woman does not equal mother anymore. And that's really at the core, being being very, very simple, down to basics. Obviously, this is somewhat reductive, but that really is what it's about. It, because, you know, we don't connect man to father in the same way. Uh, you know, there have always been sort of um, men with bachelor status for various reasons. And that was seen as a, a quirky and eccentric uh, lifestyle choice, but completely valid. It wasn't seen as quite as shameful as, you know, being a spinster. Oh, you know, because who's going to take care of you? You see what I'm saying? That's really what it comes down to. So the idea of, you know, women who are involved with other women, well, that's not going to produce a child. Therefore, it's sinful. Right. And. Let's face it, the whole thing with trans women is just one step removed. We're getting further and further and further away from reproduction, defining the connotations of gender and gender identities. And every time we have taken a step away from that, we have had a struggle. Every single time, you know, oh, women working outside the home during industrialization. Well, that's not the same as a man working because let's face it, they have kids. That so is a no, it should be the same. It's the same. And, and female dominated professions get paid less than male dominated professions because when various pay scales were set, that was the idea. Oh, women didn't need as much because this is just extra money. This isn't raising a family on your pay. It sounds crazy now, but go back, explore history. You'll see that. Um, and, you know, people are going to argue me with this because they have been raised to think about things. They have been taught to think about things. They have been indoctrinated in the idea that basically some form of another of woman is mother or future mother or failed mother or can never be a mother. Oh, how sad for her, right? I think we can all agree that if a woman can't have children, biologically, she's still a woman. If a woman chooses not to have children, biologically, um... Uh, she's still a woman. But again, when people want to get nasty on web forums and things like that, you know, one person brought this up in the comments. They say, I hope you never have children to me. It's like, don't worry about it. Um, but men don't get that the same way. Men don't get, I hope you never have children. It, it's not the same connection, right? This is something we still need to work on. So there is a role, getting back, where Leanna, where are you going with this? Here we go. There is a role for the examination of what it is to be a woman, what it means to be a woman, and how we can separate being a person from this reproductive thing that let's face it because of various scientific advances is no longer necessary right you know people who I believe people should get paid to be surrogates I think that's that's really noble work it's no different than using your body to be a landscaper or construction worker or anything like that. you're providing a service for somebody I think that's really really good because again it allows people to set their own destinies. It allows people to be more free. It allows people to feel more fulfilled because they're not tied to, um, they're allowed to define themselves based on their minds and their ideas and 
who they are on the inside as opposed to just these meat sacks we walk around in. Um, and I think that's really important for everyone, right? Because, and, and this is where I'm going to pivot a bit and make a suggestion that might be more appropriate for today. The weakness with the whole idea of feminism and the weakness with examining the world through a focus on a single gender is that it is incomplete. Instead of saying, okay, we have these imbalances in the world and this is how it negatively affects women, this is how it negatively affects men, and trying to balance the scales from both sides. We talk about the advancement of women, which of course sends a message to a lot of men that they have to lose for women to gain. And of course, one of the things critical race theory gets right is you don't tend to get social progress without interest convergence. Meaning, you know, in the case of critical race theory, well, something's got to benefit white people too before anybody will agree to it. But that's true of anything. Anybody will push back just emotionally against something that feels like a loss. And so there was a faint when when I was when I was in university to make it gender studies instead of women's studies that and it's basically, you know, gender and, and sexuality studies where you deal with, you know, queer theory and feminist theory and, and various interdisciplinary studies all kind of got mushed together. And in some ways it worked out better because you, you know, gender and sexuality are not the same thing. There are a lot of connections, right? Um, so why not take a more holistic view? Why don't we, and, and I think there's no term, no simple term for this other than, um, you know, Judith Butler tried to call it, tried to call what, what they did gender performativity, gender performativity theory, um, because a lot of Butler stuff was based on drag, but look at it holistically with all genders, people who are new to this channel, I subscribe to the five gender theory. It's not new. I didn't make it up. It's the one of a lot of indigenous cultures practice. Um, but, you know, examine everything. Take everything in. So we don't get this thing of um, somebody always feeling left out the minute someone starts talking. And yes, sometimes people do need to wait their turn. But when a working class man, for instance, is working, you know, 12 hour shifts with no health insurance and is barely getting by, sometimes not making their bills every month, it's very hard for them to listen to, oh, women have it worse than them, which is not all women have it worse than them, right? But if we look at these, these things, if we do trace it back through history, if we do trace it back, like, like I talked about with a lot of things about gender are actually offshoots of the disposability of the working class. And again, that concerted effort by the part by the the minority who, that controls the majority the basically it all traces back to proving the divine right of kings um somebody had to create rules that showed that it was just that a handful of people could tell everybody else what to do by act through accident of birth and anything we can do to get away from that is um, is of benefit. I mean, I know I'm still getting used to the idea of talking about men's issues. Um, it's rewarding. It's very interesting. It still feels uncomfortable. 
But that's why it's worth doing. I'm best when I'm outside my comfort zone. Not too much, but somewhat outside my comfort zone. It means I'm growing. It, it means I'm, I'm, I'm learning and improving as a person. And that was one of the things Betty Friedan identified that the world actively discourages women from doing. And my, my uh, thing's going bing, bing, bing. Um, but I, while I think there is a role for women's organizations around the world because of menstruation taboos and access to uh, menstruation products and so on and so forth, and, and then just, you know, marrying off 13 year olds to much older men uh one child policy meaning boys were favored so on and so forth um a lot of issues we tackle here you know in in north america and 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 europe um really should be approached more holistically. And I don't know what you call that. I'm open to suggestions. Because I do think that these divides are becoming impediments to, to, to further progress. Um, and, and that's why I've sort of adapted my approach accordingly. Um, but I'm interested in what you think. But this is a check-in again on, on where I'm at and what my views are. Here we go. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Or buy a one-time Leanna Care sessions for someone who can really use it but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.